it's on. It's red. <laughs> bing, bing. Okay. All right. Welcome to organization case studies in organizational leadership. I'm sorry that I could not be in class, uh, but I did have um, a medical issue to take care of, and um, and so I'm going to record this, and then we will resume class next week, just as uh, as normal at two o'clock in our in our room. You will find the syllabus in Sakai. Uh, you probably need to go ahead and pause this and print that baby off and look at it right now as we're going over it. I'm Dr. Morales. My office is in the Humanities Building, room 301. It is on the third floor right across from our classroom from 308. And just you can on um, the first door when you walk through the through the uh, the door right there into the office suite and come see me, of course, at any time. My office hours are listed on the syllabus. However, please know that I don't teach on Monday or Friday. And so any time on Monday and Friday that I'm here, my door is open, you may, of course, come in and come see me. I welcome all visitors. Also, Wednesday mornings before this class, um, you're the only class I teach on Wednesday, and so feel free to come in during the mornings. Otherwise, on Tuesday and Thursday, I teach all day. You can catch me come and go in between classes um, as, you, um, as you are able to. I'm not going to read. The, the syllabus, but I am going to uh, stress a few things. Um, number one is the textbook, is case studies. Can you see that in there? Yep. Yes, okay. Is case studies and organizational um, communication, uh, and this is in the bookstore, of course, or you can get this online, uh, whichever is your preference. Make sure you get it as soon as possible. Not in the bookstore, but strongly suggested, probably off of Amazon or Chegg, is the APA, the Easy Way, which is an APA guide to um, uh, a, uh, formatting and writing papers for our class. And you probably need it for all of your communication classes. If you do not have an APA style manual, you probably should get one. Um, expectations for this course is that you are required to participate. It is vitally important. Uh, that you participate in here. This class is boring. I cannot do three hours by myself. This requires a give and take from you and me. And so I strongly recommend that every reading assignment is done before you get into class, that you come not only having read, but um, besides that, um, with questions in mind or comments, examples that you found um, that help illustrate some of what you read. Just because we read of one case study in the book doesn't mean that there are not many others that you can also find examples. Please go out of your way um, and add to your educational experience by bringing, doing some research, looking around on the news, and bringing that stuff in, especially current events. It is important to note that some topics might be emotional, uh, uncomfortable, and personal. And although this process might be difficult at times, ad hominem attacks are never allowed. If we're able to have a completely civil discourse and honest discussion in our classroom, this course should be quite productive. We are all responsible for creating and maintaining, of course, that safe learning environment. We will not countenance snowflakes, but we will ever remain very respectful of other people at all times. Um, first, seek to understand rather than to be understood. And disagreements are expected, but it is the ideas that we challenge, not the people. Please remain open to ideas. We don't need to change your mind about anything, but we do need to make sure that your education is complete and that you are capable of seeing reason on many sides of any situation. Speak for yourself, not for other people, and share your concerns freely with the class. If you are offended, say so, but tell us why. Again, we don't want snowflakes, but we do want to be um, ever mindful of the situations from which other people come. Perfect attendance is as expected. It's a well, once a week, three hour class. There are only 15 class periods and uh, this is a tight schedule. So you need to be here. You need to be here for the entire class, of course. 
each absence is the equivalent of one week. Um, so you, you need to understand how important it is for, for attendance in this classroom. Always email me, let me know if anything is arising that will prevent you from attending class or um, if you need to leave class early for something. I am not really all that impressed with people who think that they can leave my class early just because they have a job interview in Norfolk. Um, you need to understand, of course, that although you do need a job, and I want to encourage that, class is important. It ends at, th at 4.45. And unless there's a giant snowstorm on the way or some such thing, you need to remain in class for the duration. This class is expected to um, organize, plan and organize and run our second annual World Speech Day event to be held in conjunction with our Lambda Pi Eta or the Upper Midwest Regional Communication Undergraduate research conference that is held here at Wayne State on March 12th. That's a Monday, not a day when we have class. Um, and because we are running this thing and planning it and running it, um, in lieu of class on Wednesday that week, we will consider that Monday um, event our class. As a senior level course, there are high expectations. Grow up, do your work, be responsible, don't whine, don't cry, don't give excuses. Speak for yourself, speak up, ask questions. You're required to ask questions. Do not accept something just as because it seems like everybody else agrees. Group think is never a good thing. And so we want to have good, honest, and vivid, rigorous discussion in this classroom. Ask a lot of questions. Read the syllabus. All right, so what are we doing in this classroom? Number one is that each week, as indicated by the timeline, students will post reading reflections. So you'll read the case studies in the textbook, you'll reflect on them, you'll think about them. I don't want you to summarize them. I want you to answer the questions here, um, and all of this is on Sakai as well. Um, answer the questions in written form. Don't write me a whole big long paper, but make sure that you understand what the case study is about. Um, you are to use, of course, um, course readings. Just because we did one last week doesn't mean that you can't talk about or bring in last week's course um, case study into this week's case study. You should be using these all across the board, back and forth, one building on another and adding and enhancing and helping you understand all of these case studies. So bring all of that in. Um, and um, I believe there are eight, eight reflections that are due on Sakai in this semester. Uh, make sure that you are keeping up with Sakai at all times. If you haven't been on Sakai yet, make sure you go uh, so that you can see. Um, also, Sakai has a calendar in it that has all of these deadlines. Pay attention to that. I will um, email you through Sakai, so make sure you pay attention to your Wayne State email. Class participation is required. Listening is fine, but this cannot be maintained for the entire semester. You are required to add to the discussion. Points are, are assigned for this. Also, speaking is good, but don't monopolize the discussion. Right. Um, I want you to be enthusiastic. I want you to contribute. I want you to get into this. Just don't monopolize the entire um, conversation. Please be aware of your fellow classmates. Look around and pay attention to nonverbal cues. Um, remember that in my classes, we don't do opinions, so don't use the words I think, I feel, I believe, or my opinion is. State the case. Back it up. Um, you are um, required to attend. Um, at minimum of 12 classes, five points per full class for a full 60 points. Your participation is worth 40 points. It is important that you actually participate. Your leadership opportunities, number one, of course, is the World Speech Day. And number two is anything else that you can do for our conference. Uh, and this is really important just um, also in class for any activities that we do in class, volunteering, to do things, volunteering to speak up, volunteering to assume responsibilities are all examples of leadership and I strongly encourage it. There are three major quizzes. They will be on Sakai. You will do them outside of class, um, before class, and um, they will all, I will announce these and they're all in the 
uh, syllabus anyway, and you will go in and complete those. Please use your book, your notes, and any class discussions to respond to the quizzes. They are application quizzes. They are all short answer essay, um, and uh, they need to be done within the time allotted, so pay attention to that. You will have one final case study. Uh, there will be more information on this in, later on in the semester. My plan is that you will work in pairs. There's a reason for this. Um, not, not only will you produce a paper, which is, you know, normal, but also you will do a class presentation as well as we will take your paper presentations outside of the classroom. You will take them over to Wayne High School and you will present your paper ideas on um, organizational um, ethics and um, in, into the high school and present those to high school students. Right? And that will actually be your final exam is your presentation to students, so that is required. Please pay attention to the timeline. Everything is on there, all the deadlines, all the case studies that we're supposed to read, what we're following through on. We will have three speakers. One, we will have the uh, athletic director here at Wayne State come and present to us on February 28th. We will have a speaker from Nebraska State Bank come um, and speak to us on March 21st. And at the end of April, most likely, or at the beginning of April, we will have um, a workshop during our class time on women in leadership. I will be bringing in a speaker from Atlanta for that, actually. And that is what is coming up, along with, of course, what we're doing for World Speech Day, your leadership opportunities there, um, and the conference that is coming up. If you have any questions on the syllabus, which I went over very quickly, please email me. I don't want any misunderstandings. I don't want anyone not um, remembering something or uh, having something left out that I didn't go over or they didn't understand. Please email me if you have any questions or bring your questions to class next week. And now we need to begin actual class. I'm going to go over um, some introductory information on uh, leadership. Some of us, because of the way that our, our course rotation happens um, and um, the availability of courses, some of us are at different places in our, um, our coursework that means that, that some information might be lacking. So I want to set some, some uh, foundation work here on um, organizational communication and leadership as well uh, and give you some backup so that we can all, when we begin next Wednesday uh, with case number three, that you will be already on top of some information. Because we're all at different places in um, our coursework, though, it is imperative, vital, that you ask me questions. Uh, in class, please feel free. Don't assume that just because everybody is sitting in silence that they all understand and know. Um, please don't be shy uh, and, and raise your hand and get the full benefit of your education by asking questions in class for anything that needs to be explained further. Okay. Um, this is considered lecture one. This is just bringing us um, up to par and, um, and before we begin next week uh, with, with our first case study and first um, case reflection. This course, you might need to take out some notes um, and because some of this is not in your book and, um, and you need to uh, take notes on, on this stuff. Um, anyway, although the video will be available to you, as far as I know, the entire semester for referencing, it's easier if you bring your notes to class with you so that if there are any questions or enhancements, you can always refer back to your notes or add to them in class. So this course should help students begin, uh, become hyper aware of ethical dilemmas and theories based on the duty, the rights, utility as in utilitarianism, virtue, and relationships, especially within organizations. Specifically, we will focus on case studies of organizations that either enable or constrain common elements of ethical practice, such as alignment, dialogic communication, participation, 
transparency, accountability, and courage. We'll get into the, all of those in just a little bit. Our textbook seeks to conceptualize and historicize ethics-oriented cases by first providing a theoretical foundation of ethical perspectives that can be applied to each of these cases. Second, by identifying sets of ethical practices that might serve as examples for future organizational behavior, especially for yourself as you go into your future business um, work. And finally, third, drawing upon the relationships between all of these cases within a particular time period to see if there are periods um, where we are more or less prone to engage in unethical behavior. As such, these cases should be seen as the starting point for a more thorough and complex understanding of each case. So our plan after you read about the case before class is to discuss in depth, really get into each of these cases, ask a lot of questions, um, and, 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 and really grapple with what in reality is happening in each of these cases. We really need to dig in there so that we can talk about not only the topic itself and the, and the issues, but especially our ethical practices and understandings and how we behave according to those understandings. The cases in the textbook focus on organizations, real ones, that have confronted challenging ethical dilemmas and as a result have acted either ethically or unethically. The cases in the book represent a full range of organizational practices from really like blatant overt violations of law to exemplars of exceptional responsible behavior. An important aspect of our text is the examples present realistic accounts, so they're very real, all of these things actually happened, of organizational life. None of these are hypothetical, like what if situations, these things actually did happen. As you will see when you read the cases, the writers were asked to define the word organization very broadly. So we're not just talking about big corporations, we are talking about all kinds of organizations, educational, religious, political, nonprofit, a whole, the whole range there in general. They were also encouraged to write about um, the broader constructions of what we understand as behavior within. So we're talking about how we understand ourselves within the organizations, our work and family relationships and balance, um, our welfare to work program, so bringing um, um, uh, veterans into the workplace, so people from prison into the workplace, uh, bringing people off of um, the unemployment rolls into the workplace, health care, um, and of course our, our globalization or working with international peoples and agencies. The book then is not only explores the ethical issues within the organizations, but also within, because of all of this, the social, political, economic, ideological, and technological contexts um, that are affect that affect and are affected by organizations. That's a lot. Steve Jobs is known for saying, I don't care about being right. I just care about success. You will find a lot of people who will tell you I have a very strong opinion and they presented evidence to the contrary and I changed my mind. I don't mind being wrong. And I'll admit when I'm wrong a lot. It doesn't really matter to me too much. What matters to me is to do the right thing. Being the richest man in the cemetery doesn't matter to me. Going to bed at night saying we've done something wonderful. That's what matters to me. Well, that sounds awesome for Steve Jobs, but we live in the real world and we're doing little things, day-to-day -day things. If ethics were so easy and natural, everyone would be nice and we would not have to take this course. Sadly, human nature is fraught with fallibility. We come out of the box 
already broken. And even when we try our very hardest, we keep doing really stupid things, even when we know better. And most often, we refuse to admit when we are wrong. We are not like Steve Jobs at all. And if we cannot control our own actions, then how on earth can any organization, especially the really big ones, remain ethical at every level? How is it that Harvey Weinstein was able to continue his deplorable actions against females for so many years? Why did so many otherwise outspoken people and powerful people not shed light on the actions of apparently, allegedly, so many men in Hollywood? Why did so many powerful Hollywood women scream and march and threaten the President of the United States for alleged sexual misconduct but remain silent about the creeps within their own industry. One of the most compelling explanations for the misconduct concerns issues of power. So before going into the introduction of our text, let's talk about power. Now some of you might have had um, this power information in other classes. It is good for us to review all of this before we go any further. Now, according to Peter Nordhaus, author of Leadership Theory and Practice, power is the capacity or the potential to influence. This is different from persuasion in that power involves differences in status. In her book, The End of Leadership, um, in 2012, Kellerman argues that there has been a shift in leadership power during the last 40 years. Power used to be the domain of the leaders, but that is diminishing and shifting to the followers. Changes in culture have meant followers demand more from leaders. Access to technology has empowered followers, given them access to huge amounts of information, and made leaders more transparent. The result is a decline in respect of leaders and leaders' legitimate power. In effect, leaders or followers have used information power to level the playing field. Power is no longer synonymous with leadership, and the social contract between leaders and followers, leaders wield less power, according to Kellerman. In one sense, we can think of a couple of examples right out of the box on that one. For example, um, the uh, student protests that have occurred on, on several campuses, mostly on the East and West Coasts, uh, regarding otherwise controversial speakers on their campuses for graduation, like, ooh, I don't want that person on our campus, and so we, we um, rally and stampede the president's office and demand changes and revocations of invitations for people to speak at our campuses. Uh, because we don't like what is happening. We don't like having um, other people entering our world. And um, students now are making demands from the presidents of universities to make changes according to student wishes rather than the presidents of universities then being the leaders and, and then making their campuses run according to some traditional way. This is also easy to see in the examples recently that have come out regarding sexual predators, um, both in the entertainment industry as well as um, in politics. And so, of course, um, just the accusations now, uh, there, 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 there are no lawsuits even being brought forth. There's nothing to be done legally because some of these cases are so old or outside the bounds of law. But just the accusations of sexual misconduct, um, and, and at any level, from toping, uh, touching, to groping, to raping, they're all treated the same. And just the accusation and the publication in the public sphere of those accusations is enough to ruin, bring down very powerful people. Now, how is this happening? First, let's look at the traditional basis of power. There are six of them. I'm sure you will remember these. First, there is referent power, which of course is based on the followers' identification and liking for the leader themselves. So for example, 
that uh, wonderful teacher on campus that her classes, his classes are always filled every semester. Everybody just loves this, this professor um, based on the liking. There's expert power based on the followers' perceptions of the leader's competence. So for example, um, when you, instead of, of um, going into a classroom setting where you like the professor, you go into the classroom um, and you do all kinds of work, but, um, even though the professor is really, really hard, simply because you recognize their expertise, even though they expect much from you, or from a tour guide that really knows her stuff when you go through. Legitimate power is the third kind. This is associated, of course, with having the status or formal job authority. So the president, Ramus, um, she's a president here at Wayne State College, um, has legitimate power as the president. She can make certain decisions. She can require us to act in a certain way or do a certain thing or not allow something based on the power that she holds as president. The fourth kind of power is referent power. This is derived from having the capacity to provide rewards. For example, um, the supervisor who gives rewards to employees who work really hard. You get a raise, you get a promotion, right? And, um, and this person or persons have the power to offer those rewards. On the other hand, coercive power is derived from the capacity to penalize or punish other people. So, for example, the coach who sits players on the bench because you're late to practice, right? Or you didn't bring the right uniform, and so you're benched. Uh, this is referred to as coercive practice. So in order to gain compliance, um, the, this person then can, can use punishment rather than reward. So really, the, um, the reward and coercive powers often go hand in hand. It's not like one is just all one and all, all the other. And finally, especially the one we we're talking about earlier, information power, which is derived from possessing the knowledge that others either want or need and don't have. For example, the boss who has information regarding new criteria to decide employee promotion eligibility, or um, for followers, of course, as in the case earlier, when they have information about someone else um, and they use that as a way to get what they want. In organizations specifically, there are two kinds of power, and this might be a little bit new for you if you've not taken um, organizational communication. Um, there's position power and personal power. Position power, of course, is something like legitimate power, so it resides in a, p a particular office or rank um, in a formal organizational system. So here at Wayne State, um, that, that, that position power would be, obviously, the president has power over the vice president, who has power over the deans, who has power over full professors and associate professors and assistant professors. Then uh, the professors have power over the students, right? Um, and that is um, in, in the traditional formal um, a chart of, of power relations. Personal power then um, is derived as, as within the person themselves. And so often we say that this person has likability or charisma um, and, um, and they have um, qualities that we strongly admire. And these qualities might be um, something like intelligence um, or, or expertise in something. Physical prowess or they are beautiful or handsome or they are built right. Uh, we, as a society, very much value, and we, um, we have a tendency to follow or to believe the more beautiful people in our society. Um, also, we are um, very um, impressed by people with connections and, of course, people with money. Now, within organizations, obviously, the stakes can be pretty high. Employees or other kinds of subordinates might be expected to do all kinds of things besides just do your work. You're expected, of course, to jump through certain hoops to get that work done, or to toe a certain line to get that work done, or just follow along the traditions of the company or corporation itself. And so all of these oftentimes can be considered very constricting or constraining um, uh, forms of behavior. 
And the threat, of course, is that there is always someone who is willing or able um, to do the job or to do the job even better than, than you yourself. And as a threat, this is always ever present. Um, and, you, and because of this threat that there's always someone else who can take um, over your job, you are expendable, um, we have a tendency then to fall into ethical traps or to be, or often to, um, to behave in more compromised ways than we would prefer. So let's consider the decision making for products that might be questionable in the safety department or misrepresented on what the product can actually do. So when I was growing up, there was a very, um, I don't know, I guess it was maybe within maybe one or two years, and I don't think it lasted much after that, but a toy called the Clacker, and it was two glass balls that were attached to strings and then those strings were attached to a stick and the idea was that you would move the stick up and down and the balls um, if you did this in a certain motion with a certain speed and a certain strength um, then the balls would clack uh, down at the bottom and clack at the top and they would clack back and forth. Um, they were made of glass people and it didn't take long for the things to explode and hurt children. Um, there's also that hoverboard that was out a few Christmases ago. Remember the, the, the skateboard that hovers that, <laughs> that caught on fire frequently? Um, and so you, perhaps in, in, in order to get a product out in a, t in a certain time, especially around Christmas, for toys, uh, that whole safety thing is not always taken into consideration. Consider how the capitalist system works with developers and investors in companies and products. Money is going in and a profit is expected within a certain amount of time. And so there's a lot of push to get products out, either untested or not tested enough. Um, and, and it goes out into to the consumers. But besides that, there are also more subtle questions um, um, so that um, they when we talk about not not Steve Jobs, he's he's dead now, but other leaders in technology um, that have gone on record that their children do not have cell phones, they do not have iPads or computers, because they recognize the inherent dangers, especially associated with addiction, um, with um, uh, radioactivity, with with the the the. Uh, um, what what the radioactivity from all of these electronics do to our skins, to our DNA, and to our brain function. And so they don't allow their children access, but they want all of us to buy their products. And they gear their products oftentimes, um, especially for like Kindle Junior, uh, for children. Now regardless of the questions of the consequences of um, organizational actions can be obviously great for everyone. Even so, the ethical obligations are not that extraordinary. They are not excessive. It's not like they're difficult. Um, and it is worth noting, of course, that not all organizations produce um, um, products for profit or are geared toward profit uh, for stakeholders or for owners. It is easier to um, to, to make ethical cuts when there is a profit involved. However, there are um, examples of nonprofit organizations who have also um, come into questionable ethical practices. Uh, the most obvious that I can think of right off the bat would be the Red Cross that is known for um, paying their uh, president uh, of Red Cross like half a million dollar a year salary. So a lot of donations have to come in up front just to pay the salary of this person before any other money goes out to do any work in the field. And there are any number of what we shall call the nonprofit organizations um, that uh, the vast majority, oh my gosh, up to 75, 80% of the money that comes in actually goes into building up that